Mosses and ferns are standards. They're must-see parts of the college introductory botany lessons. Mostly, I think, because of how beautifully and tangibly they illustrate the alternation of generations, which is another big deal when it comes to plant biology. Seriously, if you get the clear picture of gametophytes and sporophytes, gametangia and sporangia, antheridia and archegonia, if you can get a clear picture of these concepts here, you're on your way to being able to follow this major theme in plant biology throughout the rest of our plant survey, all the way out to angiosperms, which have the most derived versions of gametophytes that, if you blink your eyes here and skip this step of getting a good understanding of alternation of generations, you're never going to understand what's going on with angiosperms. Your effort in this lesson is basically a worthwhile investment just for the way that it will stave off future frustration and confusion when plants get to be a lot more complicated. We'll start with the mosses, the true mosses, not to be confused with spike mosses or club mosses, both of which are actually vascular plants. Mosses are non-vascular, meaning they have no xylem or phloem to transport water and nutrients throughout the plant. And this limits both the size of the plant as well as its ability to access moisture below the soil surface. Mosses are pretty common around Southern California despite the dryness of our climate. They can go dormant and persist through long periods of drought, coming back fresh and green with the onset of the rainy season. I can collect mosses from various planted areas around the school. There's a reliable patch in the bare area near the greenhouse at the Oceanside campus. At home, I have these hanging galvanized buckets that had plants in them a long time ago, but they were too much of a pain to keep watered, and now they just have some dirt and the stumps of the dead plants and mosses in them. Normally, you think of mosses as a carpet of green, fuzzy mini plants. And yeah, those mini plants are actually the gametophytes of the moss. Sporophytes, when they're there, are also really easy to see because they look like long hair-like stalks emerging from the green fuzz with capsules at the end. If you pull gently on one of these sporophytes, it will come up with a gametophyte that it's growing out of. Remember that mosses are embryophytes, so the sporophyte always starts out life drawing nutrients for its growth away from its gametophytic mother. Now most students look at this and their first thought is that the green part underneath is vegetative growth while the stalk is the reproductive part. No, no, and no. It's always a challenge to have to revise your thinking, but that's exactly what you need to do here. We are not looking at a single generation of plant. This is two generations, two separate plants with two distinct genomes. One is haploid, the gametophyte generation, which is the green fuzzy mini plant underneath. And the long stalk and capsule is the daughter, a diploid with twice as much DNA as the gametophyte because it carries both its mother's genes as well as a full set of chromosomes from its father. The green gametophyte contained an egg that got fertilized by a sperm cell coming from elsewhere, from the father, a different gametophytic parent. And the union of the sperm and the egg resulted in a diploid zygote, which then grew into their sporophyte daughter, the long stalk and the capsule, which again is a different plant from the gametophyte, not a part of it. So far so good? I know this is weird, and it might take you a couple of passes through this instruction for it to sink in. You have to remember that the generations alternate. You go from a haploid mother to a diploid daughter, and that diploid daughter will be the mother of the next generation of haploid gametophytes. The alternation of generations is complete when the sporophyte produces haploid spores. It releases these spores from the capsule and those spores drift through the air and can land in a new location where they will grow into new gametophytes. So here I'm going to do something with the magic of Photoshop 
to give you a nice visual image of what I'm talking about with this alternation of generations idea. Here's the sporophyte and gametophyte together. Here's the sporophyte and the gametophyte separate. Notice the sporophyte had gotten a nice head start in life because of its attachment to the gametophyte. The poor gametophyte had to grow from a microscopic spore. This is the equivalent of the parent having to walk barefoot 10 miles through snow and bear infested forests just to get to school. Well, the child gets driven to school by their parent in the back of an SUV. This is also the manifestation of embryophyte development as seen in the moss. If the sporophyte had to grow from a unicellular zygote without the influx of nutrition from its parent, it would take much longer to reach a size where it could release its spores. In a dry habitat like ours, it might not be possible to turn two generations of plants, each growing from a free unicell. This embryophyte situation basically speeds up the sporophyte generation and the full cycle of two generations gets done more reliably during a single wet season. Okay, so that's what's happening at the macroscopic level. What we haven't talked about yet is how do the gametophytes have sex? We have seen what results after conception. Once that holy event transpires, you have the unicellular zygote that then grows into the sporophyte while sapping nutrients away from its gametophytic mother. But what are the events leading to fertilization? I'm glad you asked. What you need to visualize now is a clump of moss gametophytes, a fuzzy mound of green that is either all female or all male. Female clumps of moss will have only one type of gametangium, the archegonium plural, archegonia. The archegonia are the egg-bearing structures on the body of the female gametophyte. Here's where we turn to some microscopic images. I have slides of neum that are labeled archegonial head or antheridial head. Here we'll look at the archegonial head, and this means that we're looking at the girl parts of the female gametophyte. If you look at these slides at low magnification, you can see that what we're looking at is a longitudinal section. If the green tip of the moss were a head of broccoli, this would be like splitting the broccoli the long way to produce two equal halves. The archegonia are in the middle portion of the head, nestled within the leaves. Inside each archegonium, there's a single egg, and sometimes you could see the egg sitting in the middle of a little void at the center of the archegonium. The archegonium itself is both the housing for the egg, and it will also become the connection between the gametophyte and the sporophytic child after fertilization occurs. One thing that I like to point out to students here is that it's notable that there's only a single egg within each archegonium and relatively few eggs produced by any female gametophyte. This will be in stark contrast with what we see later with each male producing thousands of sperm. And this should actually make total sense to you because you know that ultimately the female gametophyte will be responsible for providing nutrition to support the growth of its sporophytic child. And usually it will be only one or two sporophytes per female gametophyte. It would make no sense for a female to produce thousands of eggs if it could only support two babies at most, right? Now, in order for the egg inside the archegonium to actually become a zygote, a sperm cell is required. And that's going to be where the male gametophytes with their antheridial heads come in. Now, while I'm collecting these things, I have seen clumps of moss in which the antheridia were easily visible to the naked eye. To use kind of a nerdy biological comparison, they kind of look like the villi on the lining of the small intestine. You can see the tips of finger-like projections, which in this case are the antheridia. Basically, these are big sperm-packed testes hanging out there in the wind, 
waiting for a rainy day to burst open, letting loose vast numbers of sperm cells. You can see what I'm talking about with this low power magnification of the antheridial head. These things up here are the antheridia that are actually visible to the naked eye. Now in contrast to the archegonia, which each had only a single egg, each antheridium is packed with thousands of sperm cells. It's a locked and loaded sperm grenade. But that makes sense too, right? What are the chances of any single sperm cell actually being carried by the movement of rainwater and getting to the doorstep of an archegonium on a female moss of its same species? Pretty low odds, right? The only way of making the likelihood of success reasonable is to make and release huge numbers of sperm cells. This is a theme that we'll see again in the ferns. Larger numbers of antheridia, and each antheridium having many sperm cells, and comparatively fewer archegonia with only one egg each. In fact, let's go ahead and look at the ferns at their gametophytic stage, which is also called a prothallium, plural prothalia. Now you're used to seeing ferns as sporophytes. These are the familiar fronds that we see in landscaping. The gametophytes are unseen by everyone except for those who are nerdy enough to go looking for them. Usually they'll be in the very moist soil near a stand of ferns. They're tiny, less than a centimeter in diameter, and vaguely heart-shaped. These are the slides with our fern prothalia, which remember is the plural of prothallium. I like to set an example for students by using the correct plural forms for Latin and Greek terms used in our discussions. Now the moss gametophytes that we were looking at before were dioecious, literally two houses, one for male and one for female. This is a term that we use when an individual has either girl parts or boy parts. This was true of those neum heads that we viewed microscopically earlier. Remember, they had either antheridial heads or archegonial heads. Okay, dioecious. Ferns are sometimes dioecious as well. The gametophytes were either female, having only archegonia, or male, having only antheridia. But depending on the species, a fern gametophyte may also be monoecious. Same thing as hermaphroditic. Monoecious is literally one house for both male and female. And we'll see examples of the monoecious prothallium as well. You'll need to know the characteristics of archegonia versus antheridia on fern gametophytes in order to tell them apart. It's not as obvious as it was on the moss. To the untrained eye, they both kind of look like dark spots on the prothallium. But with one cheat code and a little closer inspection, it's actually pretty easy to distinguish them. Now the cheat code is based on location. You know how the prothallium is shaped like a heart? Well, the spots just underneath the notch of the heart are going to be archegonia almost without fail. Antheridia, on the other hand, may be scattered throughout the rest of the prothallium, but usually they're more abundant towards the bottom, the pointy part of the heart. Now when you zoom in on the dark spots, you can actually see the difference between the two. As I mentioned before, not only are the antheridia more numerous, the number of sperm cells contained in each antheridium is larger, in the dozens, while the archegonia will each have a central egg cell surrounded by other cells of the archegonium. Most ferns are homosporous, literally same spores, which means that if the fern is also dioecious as gametophytes, with each prothallium being either male or female, the sex of the gametophyte is not predetermined by the spore. Each spore is the same. It's able to become either a female prothallium with only archegonia 
or a male prothallium with only antheridia. Now, one common trigger to send the gametophyte development down either the male path or the female path is, roughly speaking, the quality of the environment. See, some spores get lucky and they end up in a perfect spot where they have access to light, water, and mineral nutrients at optimal levels. These are the ones that will grow up into larger, healthier gametophytes that will be able to support the early growth of a sporophytic child. And they develop as females, right? Archegonia only and no antheridia. Now, other spores are not so lucky and end up in a spot with suboptimal conditions. They grow poorly and they have little chance of being anything more than a scrawny prothelium that would be totally unable to support a real child. But they can manage to produce a few sperm cells. So these pathetic prothelia develop as males, only antheridia. Now you could actually see this in our slide with the dioecious prothelia, the male and the female, both on the same slide. The male and the female look totally different. Even though they're the same species, they look totally different. The female is a normal heart-shaped prothelium with the archegonia just below the notch. While the male hardly even looks like the same thing. It never, it never grew large enough to develop that typical heart shape, but it is covered with antheridia. These are prothelia of the same species and their development as either male or female gets determined by how the gametophyte is growing. Big and strong, it's a female. Pathetic and weak, let's make him a male. As I mentioned before, some species of ferns produce gametophytes that are monoecious or hermaphroditic. These will have both antheridia and archegonia, and consequently they could hypothetically self-fertilize. This situation of self-fertilization within a single gametophyte is unique among complex eukaryotes. You know how the gametophyte is haploid? That means that all of its gametes, whether eggs or sperm, all of the gametes produced by that gametophyte are genetically identical because they're not produced by meiosis. The gametophyte is already haploid, and so it's going to be mitotic cell divisions giving rise to not only all the cells of the gametophyte, but all the eggs and all the sperm that it produces. And what this means is that if you have intragametophytic cell fertilization, that is, selfing within the gametophyte, with a sperm cell fertilizing an egg cell on the same haploid plant, you're going to get a sporophyte, a diploid, that's going to be 100% homozygous. Every single locus is going to have two copies of the same allele. Think about this and how it's different from like when you have self-fertilization by a hermaphroditic diploid animal, like a slug or an earthworm. An earthworm, that is big A, little a, can self-fertilize. It doesn't usually happen, but it's nonetheless possible, right? And if it does happen, there's going to be the union of a sperm and an egg from the same worm. But, now, it's still totally possible to end up with a big A, little a, a heterozygous genotype in the offspring, right? Yeah, uh, this worm is going to be producing big A sperm and little a sperm big A eggs and little a eggs. So you can get a big A sperm fertilizing a little a egg or a little a sperm fertilizing a big A egg and that would still be the result of a self-fertilization. Okay. Now the difference is that in the worm the gametes are not all identical because they are produced by meiosis. Now in contrast the ferns they do have meiosis but it's happening the generation before, when the sporophyte was making its spores. The gametophyte's production of gametes is by mitosis, and so you have complete genetic uniformity among its gametes. Now think about this. If you want to argue that 100% homozygosity is a bad thing for fitness, and you could totally do this, right? 
you'd have to expect natural selection to favor mechanisms that would block intragametophytic cell fertilization, right? Now, one way of accomplishing this is diesy. If the gametophytes are either male or female, remember those fern gametophytes that were either male or female? Then there's no chance of them self fertilizing. Okay, the fern solution was to make the gametophytes female when they're strong and male when they're weak. This is one way of doing this. Another way is to make the difference between male and female gametophytes predetermined at the time the spores are produced. And there are actually a few types of ferns that do this. One kind of spore grows into only antheridia bearing male gametophytes, and the other kind of spore grows into female gametophytes bearing only archegonia. But if you have different spores, you're no longer homosporous. Remember, that means same spore. This different spore situation is called heterospory. And that's what we see not only in these few obscure heterosporous ferns, but also in the rest of the plant kingdom. All seed plants are heterosporous. Okay, let's go back to the fern and its life history. We know at this point all about the gametophyte, the prothallium. And we know that these gametophytes are what grow from the spores, the homospores because there's only one kind of spore in most ferns, right? Now these little prothalia don't look at all like what we know of as ferns. So obviously there's more to the story. Well, these prothalia are like the moss gametophytes in the sense that they release the sperm from the antheridia and the sperm must be released into the water. So again, we're talking about a rainy period when there's enough water for the sperm, which are flagellated, to swim around and hopefully make it to the female prothallium and fertilize its egg. The egg stays inside the archegonium because, well, emberophyte, yeah? And then the sporophyte grows from the zygote, which you have after the egg is fertilized inside the archegonium. Okay, so here's a pic of a little fern sporophyte growing out from the archegonium of its mother prothallium. This is completely analogous to the sporophyte of the moss growing from its mother gametophyte. Both of these illustrate the defining synapomorphy of the plant kingdom, emberophyte development, right? Now one big difference is that in the moss, the gametophyte is the main generation in the cycle. The sporophyte is almost like an afterthought. The generation whose main significance is to elevate the capsule so that the spores it produces get released from a greater height, which means greater dispersal distance. In the fern, however, okay, the sporophyte is the generation that grows into the main thing that we know of as a fern. Being a vascular plant, ferns have reinforced xylem tubes that serve dual roles of both transporting water and minerals and also supporting the weight of a larger plant. In the fern, it's the gametophyte that takes that minor role. It disperses during the spore stage, and it also produces the gametes, fertilizes the gametes, gives the next generation of sporophytes a head start in growth. It's really not doing little. I mean, there's quite a bit that the gametophyte is doing, but it's not the main part of the fern cycle. It's not making the big fern plants that we see and love. Okay, now the last thing to note is that being a polysporangiophyte, remember that? Ferns have multiple sporangia, millions of them actually on a good sized fern. And these are born on sori, singular sorus, that you can see if you look on the bottom side of a fern frond. That's where the spores are produced and released, bazillions of them. Okay, Now a few of these spores might land in a spot with just the right conditions to allow them to grow into gametophytes, and at that point we have closed the circle in the alternation of generations for a fern. The next step in plant evolution will be heterospory in the evolution of seed plants. Basically, what this does is split the gametophytes into two distinct sexes. 
female spores called megaspores are going to grow into female gametophytes that we'll call megagametophytes. And the male spores, called microspores, are going to grow into microgametophytes that we call pollen grains. But this is a topic that we cover at length in lecture and support in lab with a walking tour of some of our seed plant friends on campus. Okay, that's coming up two videos from now.